Yeah, I'm going to stand. Do you want another chair? No. No, but if they just come in here and that's it, you don't need another chair. Okay, good afternoon everybody. I think that we can start with this session. Hope you had a good coffee break or tea break. Uh, thank you for joining this session. Uh, we are going to tell you a very, about a very special network called the Network of Open Organizations, uh, which was formed in March 2020. And I would also like to welcome on the stage other network members, and that includes from right to left uh, Cable Green, from Creative Commons, uh, Paola Corti from Spark Europe and Polymi, TJ, TJ, what's your designation, TJ, again? In <laughs> Idaho State, yeah, Board of Education, thank you. Paul, Paul Stacy, Paul Stacy Roy Global, something, yeah. And Juliana uh, Grenley, Julian Grenley uh, from ICDE, and Marcelo Morales from Open Education Global. So these are just the ones who are attending the session uh, today. Uh, these are representing, these individuals are representing different organizations. Um, and obviously myself as uh, Igor Lesko from Open Education Global. So the network of open organizations comprises numerous organizations and also leaders in open education, and it has been coordinated by Open Education Global uh, since pretty much March 2020. As you can see, the membership includes numerous organizations at this point in time, uh, so that's Creative Commons as well, Spark, Spark Europe, the Idaho uh, State of uh, Board Education, uh, ICDE, um, as well as Wikimedia, uh, Wikimedia Foundation, European Institute for Learning Innovation and Cooperation. Uh, we have got ISCME, we have got ICDOER Advocacy Committee, we have got several IGOs, including UNESCO. So you can, you can see from the list that it's, it's a fairly extensive uh, uh, membership in the network. It was uh, really initiated in response to the UNESCO IA recommendation that was adopted in 2019. And at that point in time, at Open Education Global specifically, and, and I must just say that also Paul was very instrumental behind the conceptualization of the network and the formalization as well. Uh, we were thinking about what we can do as organization uh, to support the implementation of the, of the recommendation. And then we also real realized that actually there are many other players, many other organizations that are trying to do something about it. And so we decided that it's better to actually join forces and to cooperate uh, rather than duplicate efforts. Right? So that was the main idea behind the formation of the network. And there was an initial meeting actually in March 2020, after the four months after the recommendation was adopted, when we met in Paris with several other organizations. That was lead. Uh, the, the meeting was led by Open Education Global again with uh, Pulse as well here. Um, it was a, actually a strange meeting, wasn't it? Yeah, because. <laughs> That was, that was, yeah, when COVID started hitting, and so we remember when we, when we came to Paris and, and we were started watching those statistics, and it was like 100 cases, and everybody was really starting to get worried. And so we just got out, and I think a couple of weeks later, the entire world shut down for quite a long time. So in any case, we managed to formalize the network during that meeting, uh, which was wonderful. And we have uh, really, the, the objective of, of the network initially was to really implement, um, to support the implementation of the UNESCO IA recommendation, but the mission has since evolved. Um, we also work on sort of large scale open education efforts uh, that require coordinated action. Um, and that's the main reason now behind the network's um, uh, existence, but obviously we still support the implementation of the UNESCO IA recommendation as well. Uh, we are, you know, the membership in the network is really open to any organization that is supporting the mission, um, the vision, or the philosophy of the network. You will be able to read up about all of those on the network's website. We will share the link with you towards the end of the presentation. 
And the way that this works is that uh, members, uh, we meet monthly uh, during like coordination meetings um, and where we share respective updates, organizational updates about what we are doing in support of the UNESCO YA recommendation uh, and other open education events and that we are, our activities that we are working on. Uh, we also discuss possibilities for promoting the network during different events, uh, such as this one, for example, today. Um, we also dedicate some time to discussing big picture ideas or, or items. For example, there has been some discussions about the role of policies or effectiveness of open education policies, uh, Wikidata for education, or, or the role of AI in open, which was also led by Paul recently. Uh, all of these outputs are available uh, on the network website. And obviously all of this is done collaboratively. So participating organizations set the agenda, take notes collaboratively, yeah, there is, uh, but the overall coordination is taken by, by Open Education Global. And just to share with you a couple of these outputs that we worked on collaboratively as a network, um, this is one of those is the OER recommendations actions metrics. So when the recommendation uh, was adopted, we started thinking what can we do um, as the network to support the implementation of the recommendation. And so the metrics actually proposes some very concrete action areas for both governments and institutions that they can consider to help with the implement, to, to help support the implementation efforts under the five main um, action areas. So it's kind of like a guide. Um, and this is available also on the network website. And we are also very happy that, it, that, that big sections of it actually have been reused uh, recently in the, in the UNESCO briefing notes um, that I, I think that were published in the draft format on the OER Africa website in July. And I think that uh, the finalization of that is going to be sometimes next year, probably. Um, then we also worked on uh, several case studies. This initiative was, uh, well, one thing that we need to showcase is the impact of, of the movement, yeah? and the best way to do that is really through case studies. And so this, this specific initiative was coordinated by OER Africa, where different network members uh, collaborated on, on preparing different case studies to demonstrate, the, uh, the, um, to demonstrate how OER can be used to improve access, uh, improve learner outcomes, or reduce cost or facilitate professional development opportunities. This collection of case studies are available on the OER Africa website, so we really do encourage you to, to peruse them. Um, and here are just some observations from participants in the network in terms of what they value about, about being part of the network. You know, a big part of it is really for everybody to have the opportunity to learn, to share, to collaborate from others. Yeah? And the important part is also to not duplicate efforts. Um, but you can read up on these uh, reflections um, in your own time. But in the meantime, I think I'm going to stop speaking. And I would really like to give an opportunity to the other members sitting here to maybe express their views or make some comments or just kind of the audience to ask questions. That was rather quick. Um, well, I guess maybe one thing I would say is that it is important for you to realize that the network of open orgs is is open for anyone to participate in, and there's no cost. There's it's free. The major commitment really is around uh, participating in the monthly meetings, and those monthly meetings serve as a mechanism for all of those that are participating to share news about what they're doing in the field of open education, what they're doing around supporting the UNESCO OER recommendation. And then um, often out of those meetings, there's sort of uh, small subgroups that form around a particular initiative or opportunity. And those groups can then meet separately from the big monthly meeting. But it is an open, an open call. And really, the whole idea is, can we work and achieve a bigger impact together than we currently achieve separately? And the whole idea is the UNESCO OER recommendation in particular created a big opportunity for open education, but it's hard to help fulfill what the recommendation promises when we're all just a bunch of separate, siloed, little organizations. And so the idea is, can we join forces and collectively work on something that has a bigger impact? Thanks, Paul. Anybody else? Cable. Uh, I, I guess two two comments. Um, 
One, just to be self-critical, I think we've not yet accomplished what we set out to accomplish, which was to help with the implementation of the REC. So we've done a lot of good work, and we've created some resources, and we're, we're a bunch of orgs that don't usually work together this tightly, and we are meeting monthly and sharing and helping each other, and that's all really good progress. But I think what we always dreamed and probably still dream in the group is, uh, you know, and this is, was one of the ideas around the matrix that we created, is that we could go to a national government and say, you are a signatory of the recommendation on OER. Um, we are a group of organized organizations with a set of a menu of services uh, against the specifics in the recommendation, and we can, we're actually ready today to help you implement. And so would you like to work with us? And I think we're still headed toward that. Um, that's something that I think a, a lot of us want to do. Um, and we just haven't quite gotten there yet. Um, but I think that's still, a, that's still something we want to do. Um, and then the second comment I make is, as I was talking this morning in the keynote, and I was saying, hey, we need to you know, build a plan for the future. Um, I think as we, as we do that, and also as we just try to help governments implement the REC on OER, there's so much work to be done. If you just look at the matrix, just the recommendation itself has five sections and you know seven subsections in each of those five sections. It's tremendously detailed. And then we went in at that detailed level and said, here's where our orgs have expertise, have capacity, and could actually, not for free, like we'd want the governments to, to fund our work, uh, but we can support and help at these levels. And so, you know, when you look at it at that very tactical level, there is a ton of work that needs to be done. And I would argue that the orgs that are currently part of the network of, of open orgs, and there are many of us, um, there probably aren't enough of us. And as, as you heard from both Paul and Igor, there's an open invitation to join. So, I mean, this is truly an all hands on deck effort that's needed there are, what is it, 193 member states? And then the US just rejoined UNESCO recently, so 194, I think it is now. Um, and that's a lot, right? <laughs> it's a lot of governments to work with, and we don't have the capacity to work with them all right now. And so if you're interested in this kind of work, um, you know, first, we'll st we're, st we're still figuring out how do we do this? How do we work with UNESCO? Uh, so that you know, maybe eventually we can get UNESCO to help advertise these types of services. How do we get organized? Igor has done great work recently with the, the website so that we can be clearer with the world about what we're ready to do in terms of providing support services. Um, so it's, I would say it's the right idea, not fulfilled yet, but we're pointed in the right direction. Thank you. Uh, just to clarify, this was a collaborative effort as well about the website. Thank you, Cable. I can't take the credit. <laughs> but if I, if while we are speaking, while we are speaking, TJ as well, I, can I just ask our uh, support team to please click on the, the URL network of openorgs.org so that we can showcase the website as well? Because actually today is a special day because we are actually just launching the website for the first time today. Yeah. So I'll, I'll just add uh, on this invitation from Paul and, and re-emphasized by Cable, uh, the, you saw the list of organizations. I think I'm, I'm a little bit of an oddball out because I actually am in the Ministry of Education for a, a, a governmental entity uh, and potentially one of those that would want to be influenced by this <laughs> network. Uh, but I think what that speaks to is how open it is. Uh, we, we in Idaho are doing a lot of work around open and so we consider ourselves an open org. Uh, and so I think there's a broad definition, someone correct me if I'm wrong uh, in terms of this invitation, but you might not see yourself in this because you might work for an institution or you might work for something that wouldn't consider itself an open org like some of the others that are dedicated to openness in their missions. Um, but I think there's a space for this, even if that's just thinking through, I bring a perspective to this uh, that's a little different because I work on the policy issues or on the, on the tactical things or implementing that. And I would say Idaho leaders probably don't even know that this recommendation exists mm -hmm. um, upward. And we're thinking about how do, we, how do we connect into that without saying the word UN, because that's a dirty word in Idaho, unfortunately. And so how do we connect to the work without, without some of the political baggage that comes in our context? I think some of these things are things that the network needs to consider. And so we haven't had those conversations yet, and we'll probably have them 
next, but uh, I just wanted to expand that from why I'm sitting up here. Thank you, TJ. Paola? Yeah, so maybe that's the value of having you in the network of open orgs because you bring that perspective that none of us can bring in. And uh, uh, it's interesting, for example, from my perspective to look into the work of the other organizations to find ways to better do my job and uh, advocate in, in a more effective way at uh, the national level in order to at least ignite the dialogue and start a conversation, find someone who is willing to discuss at the governmental level uh, about uh, a recommendation that they signed. <laughs> so somehow they committed to implement and uh, they have people around willing to help. So the network of open doors can also help uh, me uh, and the people with me uh, to find better ways to be effective. Okay, yeah, so I think I just wanted to say, um, I mean, Julianne Granley from ICD, the fact that the network of open orgs is actually very much a forum of organizations that share the same ideas or the sh same values. We are all working for one purpose while we're in those meetings and we're, it's a community that feels very safe and really productive in the sense that this is a place to come to and discuss ongoing work, but also to air out challenges or really have that conversation. And I think that's been very meaningful to do in a space of organizations that might be different from the conversations you would have in different other forums. Thank you very much, Julian. Also, anything from your side? Uh, well, maybe just to underscore the network word and how that means collaboration and that the network does not intend to have solution to everything, but the opposite, like having a space where we can try to find together solutions to the many problems that uh, every one of us as organizations are facing. So it's really just a space, as Julian is saying, like a safe space where we can really address uh, the questions and issues that all of our organizations are facing. Thank you very much for all the perspectives. And yes, uh, uh, just to build on what Cable was saying earlier, that we certainly haven't accomplished the mission yet. <laughs> and in many ways, we are actually going to be re-looking at the mission as well going forward. Like, what should be our purpose going forward as well? Yes, working on these collaborative projects is very really important. But what kind of more like call to action can we have, for example, you know, that is aligned around helping, for example, in cases like Paola is speaking about, you know, in, in, uh, with the implementation in Italy, for example, or other areas. And it's also important to, to coordinate with other players in the, in the field, like Colin was just speaking about the upcoming Unitwin network, right? And so we always coordinate, right? So it's important to share information about these kinds of entities um, so that we do not duplicate efforts, but on the contrary, we actually amplify our joint efforts. You know, in, in many ways, like what you were speaking to as well um, earlier on cable during your keynote about that sort of implementation plan that was, that was uh, prepared uh, in relation to Diamond Open Access, for example, yeah. Any other comments or questions? We can also open up um, questions from the audience. Yep, Antonio. Uh, you, can just go to the, you can just go to the microphone, please, so that the audience can hear also, those who are watching. Thank you. I think it's a fantastic initiative. I congr congratulate you all. Um, I'm, you know, I think I can say that in our university, we'd, we would be interested in contributing to your work. I have seen that there are a number of universities there. I'm sure this will be very attractive and very interesting for other universities in the world. But I have a question that is probably a bit difficult, but you know, I think that's why we are here, to challenge ourselves with difficult questions. The United Nations mandate you know, is for nation states but the majority of nation states on this planet do not have resources for the type of programs and interventions that are necessary uh, to embed openness. Then there are other states, like the one I live in, where our government and our state, the British state, doesn't care about this, and it's a question of who people vote and why. Uh, the other states, like Spain, where I'm from, that are almost federal states and the responsibilities for universities and education reside within regional state governments. You go and talk to the government of Spain, 
and the government of Spain will say, you need to talk to the other people. And then uh, in the middle of that, there is a complexity of you know, agents with uh, decision-making power who perhaps uh, the, the network should be looking at engaging with. Uh, when I heard uh, Cable talking about government, I was thinking, well, perhaps it may be few examples in the world with positive engagement of governments. But I think uh, it is a question of engaging with whomever has the budget yeah? and whomever has the, the power to actually um, implement and propose solutions. And in many cases, it's universities and it's the leaders of these universities. Um, so how is your approach to engagement beyond engaging nation states or ministries of education? Thank you. Thank you, Antonio. Who would like to react to that? I'll say something. Okay, we'll, we'll take turns answering this. I, I think it's a little bit of um, demand and push, right? It's a bit of a push-pull thing. So uh, I think ideally we would prefer to have, uh, to say, hey, here we are, and here's all the things we can do, and if you need help, come and talk to us. Uh, but we also recognize that we, we also need to put ourselves out there and kind of say, and be proactive about finding those opportunities. Yeah, and I was, I, I mean, it resonated, your comment resonated with me as a, as a representative, the, the deputy minister of one of those states uh, that probably exists in a lot of countries. Some countries are a lot more top down, but I imagine most are, are not. Uh, and so it's a lot very distributed and, and getting to the right people or what action makes sense. If I just think about the United States, the U.S. Department of Education has very little impact on education. It's 7% of the funding uh, for, for higher education comes from the federal government. The rest of it comes from the state. And it's the same is true in K-12. It's just special education that comes from the federal government. So there's not a really fiduciary lever there either. So that means you really are dealing with 50 independent nations <laughs> in a way um, on that side. So it, there may be work we can do to, to help nations in that model know what, what, how, how to implement these recommendations in their distributed model, which will look different from small, uh, other nations that don't have that model. And that's something I don't know that we've addressed yet. But I'm very curious about it because I don't interact with the United States Department of Education hardly at all on anything. And if they told us to do something, we probably wouldn't do it. So um, it has to happen some other way. So I'll be, I'll be a bit provocative, and I'll push back on one of your premises. Um, I think that, so I tried to do this in my talk this morning too. I think all governments of the world, regardless of how many resources they have, uh, if you sat down with their minister of education, they would all say, yes, education is important. And they would acknowledge that they signed the recommendation on OER. And then if you got into a conversation with them, they would say, yes, education is a public good. And if you have enough time with them and you walk through open education, uh, they would uh, agree if they're reasonable, rational actors that in fact open is probably better on many variables than closed. And if all they care about is money, then you look at the money that they're already spending in existing budgets and you explain to them how if they did some of that open versus closed, it would actually save them money, if money's what they care about. And so I, I have found that it, uh, there's always an opportunity to work with any country, but you're absolutely right in that you've got to get to the right people who have the right authority. And sometimes that doesn't come immediately. So, you, uh, so we talked about being at a university. You're at a university. Sometimes, uh, in fact, we were doing this last week at the CC Summit, uh, we don't have n direct national government contacts, for example, in Bangladesh. And so we met with the, one of the senior administrators of the Open University of Bangladesh, who does have those contacts. And because what we want Bangladesh to do is to essentially join the Open Climate Campaign and require that all their future research is open by default. And so we had to find the right pathway, but the goal was still the national government. And so what we're doing is we're arming the, our advocate in country, who happens to be the head of uh, finance for the Open University 
of Bangladesh. His name's Mustafa. And uh, he will go make the arguments to the government. And if and only if he needs us to come in, we'll get on a plane and go, but we'll follow his lead. He may not need us. What he may need is for us to help him write policy and to write drafts and to uh, create arguments and to, uh, to lay, out this, lay out the sequence of the argument so that he can go make it uh, in, in his way, in local language, uh, in the, with the appropriate political decorum that it requires, that he knows better than we do. And so my pushback is that there's always a way. It may be tricky to find the way to the national government, but because every government in the world is engaged in their budgets with their structures of national government in education, there's a pathway through that. It's not always easy to find the pathway, but it's there if you look hard enough. I think what Paul brings up is super interesting, the push versus pull. I think our hope is that if we do a good job as the network of open orgs on the website and advertising the services, that we'll get a lot of uh, people that will come to us. That's always easier, right? If a government comes to us and says, hey, we want to work with you, that's half the battle right there. Uh, if we have to persuade a government that is reluctant, that's much more difficult. And so, you know, we, as with any adoption of new ideas or new technologies or whatever it might be, it's always easier to work with willing partners than unwilling partners. Uh, and I think that's the next challenge. I, you know, Igor is saying we're going to have to talk about what's next for us. Uh, my hope is that that's part of the conversation. How do we, how do we become known in a way that people start to come to us and ask for our service. Yeah. Thank you, Cable. Like with our Knowledge Equity Network, Antonio, see? The same approach, yeah? Um, okay, two, two hands. Jean, who was first, Gino or Ayla? Ayla? Ayla first, okay. And then I see somebody at the back. Is it Karen? Okay. We have got three minutes left. Please try to be concise. I will try. Um, <laughs> so I think the power of, um, of the network of open orgs is that because many of you are already established and you already have, you have chapters, like significant chapters on the ground in different, like all communities that all, so it's almost as well about connecting those communities, many like CC and Wikipedia communities and open education work together. But with that, as in arming them to then also approach their governments as well. So it becomes kind of like, you know, to utilize the, what we already have in a way, yeah, that it doesn't just stay at headquarter kind of like HQ space. Anyway, it's more a comment than a question. Yeah. Thank you, Ayla. Then Gino and Karen, uh, and that's going to be the... I think that's the last two, yeah. Okay, cognizant of time, and thank you. I think exactly what Isla just said, because my question was this, and I think use it as a statement, maybe, or a provocation, hey, Ken, yeah? Um, so will the network try to create other organizations by common location, so regional, yeah? Um, intention of opening, or, or industry, even, right? And then, or is it going to be for existing organizations only, even maybe now up front or later? You will, because for me, some places need a catalyst. And maybe there's a champion there, but then to put that person into connection with others, because you are the organizations that know where things are happening. So it might be a good opportunity to sort of meta network people. Yeah, that's a that's a good suggestion there, uh, Gino. Think, and I mean, something too that we need to think about as 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 we are, you know as we move forward with uh, with the activities of the network. I mean, the mission. So this is something to consider. But actually, we try to expand and diversify membership in the network as well. You know, so like for example, we are looking for more organizations that are already active in different countries. Like for example, in African countries, Latin American countries. There are many of those that are doing meaningful work that can be invited to join the, the network already. Yeah, we just need some help to. To, to help identify the relevant ones, yeah? Um, Karen. Thanks. Um, it seems to me that from what Cable was saying and the rest of you that, you know, maybe a thing for the network to do is really set priorities about, like, which governments to target first. Because I hear what you're saying, Cable, like, we don't want to target reluctant governments and maybe let's wait for them to come to us. 
but are there not governments that may already have a little bit more propensity? Like, is it Canada? Like, where is it? You know, and to start with one model government, that seems most likely, and that maybe the network could try to identify that particular government that's already a little bit on board and court them in, in a back and forth. And if you get one government on board, that's gonna serve as a model. So that's just a suggestion. Uh, thank you, Karen. There are probably several examples of those around the world that have been already doing different activities, but you know, in terms of policy instruments or whether these are other types of you know, policies that have implemented yeah, that we could draw on, yeah. And uh, I just want to say, Karen, that's a great idea. And, and one of the things that has happened with the UNESCO OER recommendation is there is an expectation that uh, the countries that sign it report out on progress. And so uh, just recently there was a report out on progress. And so we're now kind of looking at the results of that report out and hope to identify some of those perhaps first partners that we could engage. Yep. Thank you, Paul, for that comment. We ran out of time, but I just want to ask our support team to please put the slide deck back on at your earliest convenience. Thank you. Uh, I just wanted to show the, the final slide. Yeah, that's it. Thank you very much. So again, just sharing the, the URLs to the website. Also, if you have any questions about the network, if you would like to join the network, please email us at info at networkofopenorgs.org. And thank you very much for your attention.